Okay, so I think in the interest of time, we can go ahead and get going. Um, we're really glad to welcome everybody here for our fifth Open Force Field Workshop, uh, which is amazing and exciting. And um, we have a bunch of really great uh, updates to give you today and um, looking forward to the, the dialogue that starts um, and the great things to come. So we'll be doing a bit of jumping around between speakers to cover the different areas of updates within Open Force Field. I'm going to lead off with kind of an overview and some highlights of, of what's going to come in the rest of the talk. And then you're going to hear from Jeff about um, infrastructure and toolkits and, and, and the great software we're working on. And then from Lily on science and, and Diego on the project management side. Um, a couple points of order. So we have this set up as a webinar um, so that we can handle larger numbers of people and so on. And so that means it works a little bit different, but be, feel free to use the chat and the Q&A features in Zoom to ask questions during the talk. So typing them in. And then the speakers will try to answer questions in the Q&A after we're done with our presentations. Um, and there can be some dialogue in the, in the Q&A over there, the chat, um, as things go on because other people also know the answers aside from just the speakers. And then after the conclusion of talks, there'll be discussion and opportunities for more Q&A. Um, we do have to enable your mic, so you'll have to raise your hand and um, we'll call on you when it's your turn. So without further ado to, to get going, um, you know, really we're here because of you. And you know, this is a slide you've seen many times before, I think. Um, but you know, it's, it's great working with such an exciting group of people and having this feeling that we share a common set of problems that we really can make headway on by working together. So it's a, a great group of people, great, all the industry folks supporting, um, great team. And we won't walk through all of that right now because we wanna spend our time updating you on what's going on. Um, I'll remind you that OMSF, the Open Molecular Software Foundation is our, um, host entity right now. And so um, that plays a coordinating role. And uh, anyway, so let's get going on the science. Again, you've seen this before, but a key point is that openness is central to everything we're doing. And really this is partly because our problems are too big to tackle alone or in small groups. We share so many of the same problems and they're too big for any one person or any small group of people to tackle in isolation. So we need to share and we need to be open about the problems and about the infrastructure and about the tools we can use to solve them. And so that drives a lot of what we do. And that's part of why we're so excited to have more, more people and as many people as possible participating because there's too many problems to go around. Now, originally we came into this initiative with a bit more of this idea that force field development and, and improvement would be a linear and organized process where we would take an idea, we'd implement the idea, we would make force fields with that idea, we'd test the force fields, they would be great and we would release them. And as time has gone on, we've realized that our ideas and what we think is going to work best doesn't always work out the way we expect. And so it works better to take a bunch of ideas to try them with as little effort as possible or in with a minimum investment of like human time and then see which of those ideas look the best, actually look like they're gonna improve accuracy the most and then get those into the toolkits and the force fields and release them. And so that's kind of changing how we're doing things. And I think that's a theme you're gonna see coming up in the other presentations as well. So we're gonna tell you about the science and about the infrastructure. So one of the first things uh, you're gonna hear about today is infrastructure from Jeff Wagner. Um, and I'm just highlighting an overview here, but he's gonna be going through a lot more of the details um, ranging from new functionality like bespoke fit for fitting custom torsions to things that support the science we're going to later to key interoperability and other factors that our users really need. One of the things you'll hear about is virtual site support, offsite charges, and where this can be placed and how those are looking as we start trying them out in force fields. And we're excited that we are now trying these out in force fields. And this really 
uh, hinges a lot on the work of Simon and, and um, others in the infrastructure space. Also uh, now in the wild is our bespoke fit toolkit for making custom more accurate torsion parameters. Um, so it can take a molecule or a chemical series, fragment it and easily make custom torsions that greatly improve accuracy. Here's one example on the top right. Orange is where we started. And then QM and the bespoke fit results are much more similar. And one of the cool things about this is you get to easily, you can choose your favorite QM method, including GFN XTB, and which is really fast. So it's not true QM method. You can go to something slower and higher accuracy if you want, but it's um, really fast and improved accuracy. And so on the bottom right, we have some preliminary results from binding free energy benchmarking, and, and there'll be more of that to come. One of the reasons this is cool is at the bottom left, um, we have really few different distinct torsional parameters in the force field, which actually results in a quite general and pretty accurate force field. Some other force fields have far more torsional parameters, but potentially we could get really high accuracy um, torsions by just fitting some custom torsions for your chemical series of interest without um, having to make our force fields dramatically more complex. And of course, you're going to hear also about biopolymer support for our coming Rosemary release. Um, I, as I can attest from some of my postdoctoral work, uh, handling covalent modifications of proteins can be a real pain in the neck um, with current force fields, but with um, once we have a protein force field, we can easily consistently treat the protein and the small molecule. And you're gonna see an example of that today. Here's a snapshot from a simulation of this where we have an amber protein force field on the, back, on the backbone and sage small molecule force field for the covalent modification and, and it works. Another thing on the infrastructure front that we're continuing to work on is benchmarking infrastructure as You've heard in the, in the past, a key thing driving people's interest in open force field has been using force fields for binding free energy calculations. And so we've done some work in the past on benchmarking those, but we really need to turn this into something that we can routinely run in a high throughput manner to always rapidly assess how our force fields are doing. So we're working on getting that type of infrastructure going on folding at home so we can benchmark rapidly on a large scale and assess progress. At the same time to all the infrastructure work, there's a, a whole lot of really great science going, uh, going on from checking that we're using an appropriate level of QM theory to better uh, initial guesses to force fields. And a key one is protein parameters. And you're also going to hear about work on virtual sites and graph charge models and a lot of other things that are going on. One of the results, so since our last uh, open force field meeting, we did release our SAGE force field. And one of the results from that I wanted to highlight is that we fit, refit Leonard Jones to do a better job handling mixture data. Particularly we fit instead of to pure densities and pure heats of vaporization, we looked at fitting to heat of mixing and uh, mixture densities and other properties. And we found that training to mixture data actually improves the performance relative to training pure data to pure data only. So if you look at like prediction of, so not on training data, but test data, salvation free energy, um, you can see that in the orange and the purple, if we train in the old way, we increase the error. Whereas if we train in this new way, um, we decrease the error and get closer um, the distribution is more evenly distributed. And you see the same thing in this data, in this visualization as well. So that's exciting. And I think new in the force field development area that, that pure data can cause some systematic problems, it looks like, uh, especially potentially the heat of vaporization. Um, we've also made a bunch of improvements to the force field fitting process itself, and these are going to get rolled into our next release, we expect. Uh, one of them is that previously, what most of the data we were using for torsion fitting was coming from 
torsion drives only. But it turns out we also have data on what torsions should be doing from optimized geometries. So we can start looking at including information from those optimized geometries, looking at how wrong torsions are when we MM optimize geometries versus QM optimize them. And we can include that in fitting. And when we do that, it looks like uh, it improves accuracy of geometries coming out. Um, so these are plots you'll see these quite a bit. And this is torsion fingerprint deviation on the top. And we're looking for this peak close to zero to get higher. We've done also another thing we've tried out is taking a different initial guesses for parameters from the modified seminario method based on QM. And that also seems to improve accuracy of the fits we get. We're also for the first time starting to fit our improper torsions. And that also improves RMSD, so geometric measure, measures of performance and maintains good energies. And so on the bottom, you can see a bunch of these different improvements being tested at once. And um, what we're seeing in the orange is the best performance and that combines several of these different um, improvements. And you can see this on industry benchmarking as well. This is looking at energy error. And the purple and red methods are combining more of these different improvements. And we see significant improvement in this is how much, what fraction of the data is in the lowest energy error bin. And so we see that significantly improved. We're also fixing a problem with torsion multiplicities where we originally had some torsions that combine, had central atoms involving different valences. So in this case, with two connections or with three connections, that results in different numbers of torsions passing through the same central bonds. And it turns out that's a mistake. So we are addressing that. We were able to refit already based on optimization data, but we're doing more torsion drives and a full refit based on that. But again, we see improvement from that also, TFD and RMSD, as we start with Sage and then we um, fix, begin fixing this multiplicity problem, we see performance improve. We also have, again, you'll hear more about this, a preliminary test of work with virtual sites. And we expect that this would make a significant difference in condensed phase properties, but we're also seeing that it improves accuracy of geometries and energetics relative to quantum mechanics. Again, these same type of plots, the top is energy error, bottom are ge geometry errors. And we're seeing that the virtual sites actually improves performance on these significantly, um, in addition to impacting the condensed phase property calculations. And there, okay, just making my slide advance here. Um, also, we've been working, as many of you know, we've been working a lot on automated benchmarking with industry, and that's showing progress as well. So as we go through our different force fields, uh, 1.2, 1.3, 2, we see improving performance on RMSD, DDE, torsion fingerprint deviation, and that's encouraging. Um, benchmarking on proprietary data sets shows the same thing. Um, this is these are plots from a forthcoming industry benchmarking paper, and this the top two include OPLS data, um, and compare Open Force Field 2.0 to OPLS and GAF. The bottom shows progress across different Open Force Field versions, and so we see as we get to 2.0, we've improved performance a lot, and we feel like we're still just getting started. There's a lot of a lot left to do, so we're excited to tell you about where that's going today. And another way of looking at the same thing, and this is on um, public and proprietary data, um, is that if you look at what fraction of molecules in a data set have energies and geometries within a specified threshold, and you can vary that threshold. In the top, we're looking at open forest field and GAF versus OPLS on public data sets from industry. On the bottom, this is proprietary data in internal partner testing, where we just compare GAF and open force field. 
And so you can see in the three different open force field colors, we've made significant progress. And this is really looking quite good. And we can also use that same data to look for trouble spots. Where are there systematic errors? And then begin trying to fix those. So there's a lot more in this on our, in our forthcoming paper. And then you'll also hear a quick update on the status of the protein force field and how that's coming along. And we're excited to be able to make a consistent protein and small molecule force field very soon. So with that, I hope I've gotten you interested in what's coming and I'm gonna hand it over to Jeff for updates on infrastructure. Great, thank you, David. Um, yeah, so I'm Jeff Wagner. I'm the technical lead for Open Force Field. And today I'm gonna to give an update on what we've been working on since our last annual meeting and what we're gonna be doing in the coming year. There we go. So this year I'm organizing my talk in terms of our organization's values. Uh, and I'm doing this because as we've grown, we've needed to figure out how to coordinate progress on these interlocking research and development efforts. Uh, we have really creative people on the team and we've got a ton of project ideas, but we've got more creativity and ideas than we have time. And so it's important that we keep all of our efforts aligned. This is Diego, not me. Diego is our new project manager and he has final say on which projects we pursue and how Lily and I ultimately spend our time. Uh, Diego, shortly after joining, pointed out that if we don't know what it is we value, we're going to lose a ton of time being confused about what's our main objective as opposed to a side quest. So he's going to talk more about this later, but once Diego had time to study our organization, he pointed out that we have sort of a hierarchy of values. And our highest value is product leadership. And for us, this means accurate force fields, accessible infrastructure, and broad interoperability offerings for our users. Our second highest objective is what's called proximity with users. And so this is things like custom solutions uh, or features that apply to a subset of force field users, but not all, and engaging in deliberate joint development with other simulation ecosystems to make shared features. And third, we want to achieve operational excellence. And for us, that means improved transparency about our plans and improved predictability about the timelines and the scope of the projects that we're going to undertake. So today I'm actually going to go through these priorities backwards from lowest to highest, because after me, you'll be hearing from our science lead, who's entirely consumed with force field accuracy. So she's got a lot of cool things to share. And at the end, we'll switch over to her to hear about more force field developments. So in everything that we do, there's this constant pressure to add one more feature or to take a passing suggestion and redirect the work that we're doing to, to do a bit more. But this comes at the cost of uncertain time estimates and miscommunications over goals. So after working through a bunch of projects, we found that when we have scope creep or ambiguity and who gets to make decisions and when they happen, the cost ends up becoming very high. So here I'm showing some project plan pages from public confluence where we have these clearly defined roles that ensure that the relevant stakeholders stay informed, but that decisions can be made by the people that are most involved. For a few of our major development projects, we're using these sorts of pages to ensure transparency and predictability. And this ensures that everybody understands the goals and that there's a concrete framework for changing them when new information emerges. And even more so than our code, it's incredibly important that we keep our standards and specifications public and current. So here I'm showing the latest published version of the Smirnoff specification, which now has a dedicated home in the Open Force Field Standards repository. This lets the specification be discussed and versioned independently of our software. So, so far in our efforts, our greatest successes have come from this pattern of specifying first and implementing second, and going specification first guarantees that we wind up with fairly thoughtful feature design for us, and it really lowers the barriers to other people when they want to interoperate with open force field software. But this is just the readable view. Uh, it doesn't imply that this is publicly writable. And that's why we have a public source repository for the same standards and specifications. So by maintaining a 
public standards repo, we ensure that we can communicate plans and potential changes to other maintainers adjacent to our ecosystem and that we have a platform for their feedback. Early on, we added a few pressing Smirnoff enhancements that were brought up in the past year. Those would be things like clarifying ambiguities in the specification and some minor adjustments to facilitate interoperability. On the left here, I'm showing the issue tracker from the standards repository showing the uh, enhancement proposals that have gone into the Smirnoff specification. And I would really love if other developers in the ecosystem could follow this repository and weigh in when we're making important decisions that might affect them. And since we're still talking about operational excellence, here's some data from Ben Pritchard showing our cumulative total number of core hours used and cumulative total number of jobs completed on QC Archive. Uh, I've labeled the Parsley and Sage releases on this graph so you can get a sense for how the, our QC Archive growth lines up with our project history. And so these numbers are going to be a bit noisy because some jobs are trickier than others, but this shows a really cool story about the scale that we're working on. And over on the right, I really want to recognize the QC submission team because they're doing an amazing job of marshalling a ton of really heterogeneous compute resources where uh, for many of them, a condition of use is that our jobs can be preempted by paying customers or higher priority users. And they've been dealing with a ton of unique challenges that they've overcome. So this team's really brilliant and we're getting some really awesome data sets from this for our fitting. And as a final point for operational excellence, I wanted to, to show what I'm gonna call the subway diagram for where we are in terms of the infrastructure team's goals. Diego is pushing us to more clearly communicate our plans, and I found it really interesting to make this because it helped us discuss longer term options and trade offs. The way to read this is that full lines show tasks that are done and dashed lines are tasks that are in progress, while dotted lines aren't yet started. The colors indicate who's working on what, and when things are in gray, that means that nobody's been assigned to do them yet. So I've added in this vertical line that shows where we are right now. So from top to bottom, we have uh, Bespoke Fit having been released a couple of weeks ago for those of you who are watching. And this is uh, a black line because Simon and Josh Horton mostly worked on this. In green, we have Josh Mitchell's work and this is the documentation track. So our themes across all of our repositories have been standardized in our documentation and we've released user guides for all of our major packages. And next up on Josh's plate is going to be the centralizing documentation examples and uh, preparing a series of example videos and running hackathons. Next is the toolkit track. And in black, we have the completion of a refactor of our virtual site implementation, which I'll be talking about more later. And it's black because Simon did this before he, before he moved on from open force field. And in blue, we have what's gonna be our next major release, which is the toolkit biopolymer refactor. And you should expect to see this in the coming weeks. In red, uh, this is David Dotson's work on our, on our QC compute marshalling. So like I showed before, we have heavily automated uh, QC computations. And uh, in the next few weeks, QC Archive and Mulsi are going to be releasing a new version of QC Fractal that's gonna require some updates to our infrastructure, which David's working on. Like Mobley showed at the beginning, we ran a season of benchmarking using a, a couple of custom made tools. And that's complete, but we do want to continue on benchmarking, especially making a more modular benchmarking framework uh, that the science team can use where we can add in new sorts of analyses uh, to, to guide our force field development. In red, we have David Dotson working on interoperability with open free energy. And uh, after that, he'll be working to complete our interface with folding at home. And I'll talk more about that later. And finally, last but not least in orange, we have Matt Thompson working, doing an incredible amount of work really to prepare interchange. And interchange has already been integrated into the toolkit uh, and it will be a major part of our next toolkit biopolymer release. But in the future, we're going to work on getting our Amber and Gromax exporters production ready and able to handle proteins and virtual sites. And after that, we're going to work on importers for things like Parm tops and serialized OpenMM systems.
So that's what I have to say about our operational excellence. Our next highest priority is proximity with users. And to me, this means new feature development tailored to either a subset of our force field users or direct commitment of resources to engage with another simulation community. So for the lucky people in this audience who haven't yet been woken up by my midnight Slack notifications, you'll be happy to know that Bespoke Fit has had its production release. This is a first in an operational model that we'd like to reuse in the future where we have the science team writing some great code and functionality. And then we wanna transition the maintenance of that to the infrastructure team so that the science team isn't burdened and they can continue forward with making more ambitious developments. The release of Bespoke Fit is thanks to a massive amount of effort from Josh Horton and Simon Boothroyd and uh, a lot of polishing of the documentation by Josh Mitchell. So Bespoke Fit is a way of running quick QM torsion scans of your molecules degree of freedom to generate extra accurate torsion parameters that replace the generic torsion parameters from a given force field. Bespoke Fit first fragments your input molecule into representative substructures, both to reduce computation time in the torsion scans and also to avoid adding complexity from distant atoms or other degrees of freedom. There's a number of options to reduce the computational cost of the subsequent QM calculations, but the most likely use case for bespoke fit would be to improve the parameter quality of a molecule before something like an even more expensive operation like a free energy calculation. So for a lot of users, the cost of the QM here is going to be kind of negligible compared to the next steps. Simon and Josh Horton put a ton of thought into the design of bespoke fit. And you can deploy bespoke fit in such a way that instead of feeding in one molecule at a time and possibly doing a lot of redundant work uh, if they fragment into identical fragments, you can feed in a ligand series from the beginning and bespoke fit will identify the common core torsions and only run the minimum number of QM jobs needed to parameterize them. So bespoke fit is really powerful. It's also a bit more complex than many of our other published tools. And so I strongly recommend that people who wanna get started with Bespoke Fit look at the quick start guide, which you can find by searching on GitHub or you can grab the link from the slide once we send the, the slide deck out. This walks through a, a pretty neat custom use case where to save time instead of doing full DFT, the Bespoke Fit can be set to use GFN2 uh, XTB, which is a fast open source semi-empirical QC method where uh, you might find that to have a better cost benefit ratio for your use cases than full on QM. So I think this is a, a really cool example of, of hot documentation from open force field. And I'd recommend that you jump into these docs and sort of choose your own adventure. Uh, but one thing we'll be doing is polling for follow-up workshops after this meeting and we'll have a poll open for about a week and then we'll run some follow-up workshops in the coming months uh, on topics of interest and bespoke fit can be a topic that we can go into more depth about or help users customize and so since we're still talking about the user proximity goal i did want to follow up on last year's benchmarking project so to review this is a project where people could feed in a bunch of molecules and then have our DKIT generate conformers of them, then use Sci4 to run a quantum chemical optimization of the conformers that our DKIT generated. Then we bring in a bunch of different MM force fields, and we see for each of these minimized QM conformers, one, would the force field keep the molecule in that QM minimum by looking at the geometry, and two, would these MM force fields accurately predict the energy differences determined by QM between these conformers. So this manuscript is nearly done. Uh, and a lot of you have probably been getting harassed to, to review the, the early state and approve it. Um, and we will of course be waking you up at midnight with channel blast in the general channel when we've uploaded it to a preprint server. So what's cool about this coordinated benchmarking project wasn't just about so much interfacing with users, but it also gave us a ton of information about the weakest parts of our force fields. So on the left, Lorenzo, who ran the study, identified some simple molecules where we're getting conformer energies wrong. And Lorenzo used our toolkits to identify which specific parameters were in these degrees of freedom uh, that ended up having large error. And so we're seeing that like T64, uh, the torsion parameter, 
uh, T74 is appearing a few times and T75 keep causing trouble. On the right, Lorenzo does a more statistical approach and he looks at how often we're getting torsion angles wrong. So that's this measure of, of violation and which parameters are assigned to the torsion when that happens. So again, our toolkit offers a bunch of custom ways to dig into what's going on with these force fields. On the left, we see sort of a case by case inspection, whereas on the right, we can we have a larger data, big data set approach. <clears throat> and so this is great. In the scope of our overall strategy, this is a nice situation where a single project serves both as a way to interface with our users uh, and help them build familiar, familiarity with our tools, but also as a way to provide quantitative data that can help the force field team. So here we could take these torsions that Lorenzo's identified and suggest targeted improvements, like maybe we could split these parameters up based around their surrounding chemical context. Okay, so now we're getting onto the main course. Let's talk about how the infrastructure team is making our force fields and toolkits more accurate, accessible, and interoperable. And so in this talk, I wanted to start each section by saying uh, what we did do since our last annual meeting. And this year, we've done a lot of small things. We've worked on the documentation. We've tried to improve the user experience on a lot of fronts. And so I can't really enumerate everything. So when I should be talking about how we've improved the accessibility of our software, I think that the best thing I can do is report the success by proxy. So the y-axis on this chart is the number of stars on GitHub that a project has. And these are kind of like Facebook likes for developers. And the x-axis is the date. And again, I've, I've labeled where we've had our major force field releases, Parsley and Sage. Uh, now, each different colored line is a different open force field project repository. And I'm showing them for a bunch of our user facing packages. So I want to say that this tells us that we're doing right by our users and our downstream developers. We're investing in better documentation, we're keeping the API stable, and overall, we're working on having a good user experience. So our, the Open Force Field Toolkit is our oldest package, and you can see that it's been gaining adoption since 2018. Uh, I didn't even join the project actually until late 2018. So this was already well on its way before I came in. But we have two major new projects that I expect to be rocketing up in the coming, in the coming months and years. And those are Bespoke Fit in purple, which, as I said, just launched a few weeks ago, and it's already gaining a lot of traction. And Interchange in brown, which is, I think, a slow and steady growth, but we're hoping that this is going to become the core of a lot of user workflows in the future. And so stars are easy to measure, but they aren't the be all and end all for us. Uh, one thing that actually really cheers me up when I'm having a bad day is to see how many other people are using our tools. So this is a GitHub code search for the string from OpenFF. And this is a string that would pop up in your Python script if you're using our toolkits. So when I do a search of public code on GitHub, I get over 1,200 results. And a lot of these are going to be our own files because we import our own stuff. Um, and a lot of these are going to be bots and duplications and things like that. But I think this is still really cool. Uh, I don't know who these people are. I don't know what their projects are doing. And that's a great way that we can have a, a project that scales out to a lot of users. So this is useful for me as a developer because sometimes we're in a situation where we want to make a little change to the API or remove something and we're pretty sure that nobody uses these small features, but we can do a search on GitHub for that feature that we want to change or remove. And sometimes we'll find that somebody is using it and they're using it in a way that we didn't expect. And that can be enough to convince us that we should just keep the feature there intact. Or maybe we start issuing a deprecation warning that tells the user what commands to replace it with in the future. And so, I think a really big component of our user growth has been the result of some great focused work by Josh Mitchell. So Josh is our specialist technical writer and scientific communicator. He's a computational chemist who's absolutely obsessed with prose and page layouts. And he's been doing some great work all over our repositories and documentation. What's really helpful is that he also brings a fresh pair of eyes 
and can see the things that we've gotten like accustomed to overlook it. So for example, he realized that when users go look at documentation for one project, there's very rarely references to the existence of other open force field projects. And so these users will come in for help with a certain task, but they don't end up discovering that we have other tools that can help them complete their whole workflow. So Josh saw this thing that this problem that we've had for a long time, and one day he just made this central documentation page. It's docs.openforcefield.org. And this page is really simple. It just lists all of our public facing uh, production ready software and uh, links to their documentation and provides short descriptions for all of them. And it, you know, I think when you're standing so close to a problem, you, you start forgetting that it's there and Josh can come in and just fix stuff like this, uh, which I think is really great. I, another example of a complete oversight by us is uh, one day Josh opened this pull request called molecular gastronomy. And gastronomy is this obscure word that basically means cooking. So Josh had added a quote cookbook to the open force field toolkit documentation. And this just lists every single way that you could make a molecule. And I realized that actually when I talk to new users or when I try to convince somebody to use the open force field toolkit, I always have to start by explaining what's an SDF and what are all the ways that they could make their molecule. And it's like, oh yeah, wait, we could have just made a page and listed all the ways to make a molecule. And that's you know the big barrier that probably deflects a lot of our early users. So Josh does all sorts of great stuff like this. Uh, he did a really good job of standardizing the themes of our documentation. So now when you go to all of our different repositories, things are very consistent. Uh, we've got that cool logo. I love this logo. And we're, we're using the right shade of blue so it matches up with our the rest of our branding. And you know, I'd like to walk through a lot of specific stuff that Josh did, but it's just like everything got easier. <laughs> and uh, if you look at on the left, this is the old form of our documentation. And on the right is a new, is the new. And when I interface with these pages, I just find them more pleasant to look at and faster to navigate. So this is supposed to be the end of me talking about Josh's work, but you're actually going to see a lot more of it because uh, I've stolen a ton of his figures for the rest of this talk. OK, so that was accessibility. Let's talk about interoperability. First, I need to apologize to everyone. We are going to be switching our units package in the next Open Force Field Toolkit release. The units package, formerly known as SIMTK units, which is now known as OpenMM units, aren't really the best option for us moving forward. And so instead, we're switching over to a solution based on Pint. Pint is this really broadly supported units package that's used all over the place, including in MULSI software, like QC Archive. And our big advantages here are that we're going to have tighter control over the serialization of our data, and that we'll be able to swap in different code data references as needed, among other advantages. So we do know that a lot of you have scripts that need to talk to an interface that expect OpenMM units or that emit OpenMM units. And so we've made sure that we have these very straightforward converters. We have to OpenMM and we have from OpenMM. Uh, and so it should be really easy to update <clears throat> your existing scripts to work with the new toolkit. Uh, and if it would help to, to see these in action, uh, we're gonna be updating all of our examples for the next toolkit release so you can see uh, exactly how these converters can be used. Some other big news for interoperability is that we're about to have interchange fully integrated into the Open Force Field Toolkit. And this has been the result of a really huge amount of work by Matt Thompson to do the initial development and the validation to show that we're getting the correct outputs. He actually, in implementing this and validating it, he looked so thoroughly that we found places where the original toolkit code was doing the wrong things. He, he went fishing with dynamite in the net and he found a bunch of bugs out in the ocean. Uh, and so, yeah, we found existing toolkit bugs just by doing large enough uh, searches. And he found areas of the Smirnoff specification where when you looked at it, it was actually incomplete. And so he spearheaded a lot of both development and specification work to shore these up. What I'm showing here is a workflow uh, that's sort of the main use of interchange for most users. And in this case, we're loading 
uh, a prototype of a protein force field. This is FF14SB ported from Amber into Smirnoff format. And we've got a topology that already exists. And now instead of running force field dot create open MM system, we're running force field dot create interchange. And if we inspect this object that comes out, we see it's an interchange. It knows what kind of potentials it contains and how many atoms. And with interchange, you can go and query parameters directly. So if you wanted to change some bond parameters or see what's assigned where, all of the information is in there and it's accessible through the interchange API. But what's great is most users don't care. And so you can still go right to OpenMM using this interchange to OpenMM function. And you'll get out the same OpenMM system that you would have by running forcefield.create OpenMM system. So to drive this point home, your existing scripts for just about all of our users are going to have a call to forcefield.create OpenMM system where you pass in a chemical topology. And now we have the option of running forcefield.create interchange with that same topology and then running interchange to OpenMM. So this is a meme from the office. Corporate needs you to find the difference between this picture and that picture. They're the same picture. And I mean that in more than a, you'll get the same result sort of way. I mean, now in both cases, the same code will be run. Uh, so you can trust interchange to, to be a core part of your workflow once we get it into the next release. Okay, so a bigger picture, what is interchange? Interchange is a lot of things to a lot of people. In a workflow, interchange is the thing that you have after you've applied a force field to a molecule, but before you've exported that to a specific simulation format. You can do all sorts of manipulations at this stage. For example, you can combine interchanges to add in components that came out of different workflows. So for force field developers, interchange is a way to reach into a molecule that's already had parameters assigned and modify the physics. And that's going to be really helpful for our fitting team. For other people, interchange is going to be our replacement for ParMed's conversion functionality, kind of like what you see on this slide. Some workflows that users want to use are only available starting with Amber and Gromax format files. And workflow makers will need a way to get their parameterized components into those formats. That's what we hope to offer for them with interchange. At this moment, we're only endorsing fully the OpenMM export route. Like I said, we've done a lot of validation on this, and we've proven that it's equivalent to the existing toolkit behavior. But we also have partially featured Amber and Gromax exporters in place, and we'll be updating you as we develop and validate these more. One thing that's not actually shown in this picture, but it's really important nonetheless, is that for machine learning people who want an entire simulation system defined as numerical arrays, there are our API points and in interchange that export to vectorized representations. But because there isn't really a single standard destination format for how you'd represent a simulation system in a machine learning library, uh, you may need to access the lower level API to, to make your custom exporter, though we do have some existing exporters that may work for you just out, out of the box. So a question that we get a lot about interchange is, well, when can I fully replace ParMed in my workflow? And the answer is that depends on exactly what you're using ParMed for. So this is a work breakdown structure that Diego helped us make. And we've been making these for a few projects in open force field, but they're super technical. So we're not gonna show any other ones today. But this is the WBS, the work breakdown structure for the upcoming interchange releases. Now on the top right is our color guide for the priority of each item. So blue is top priority, uh, and then green, and then yellow, and then purple. And you can read these colors as sort of corresponding to major upcoming interchange releases. So uh, in, our, in our work breakdown, we've got these branches for the major simulation engine. We've got Amber and Gromax and OpenMM. And under each one, we have uh, a split between export functionality and import functionality. And What's important to see here is that the exporters are all in the top three tiers of priority. They're blue, green, and yellow. Um, but the importers are all in the bottom purple tier. And this is because during our early design work, it became clear that imports, like making an interchange from a PARM top or from a serialized OpenMM system, that's gonna be way harder than exporting. 
And so because both, both directions are valuable, we're gonna get fully featured exporters working before we move on to making importers. Now, what that means for you, if you're using ParMed right now to convert from OpenMM systems made by the Open Force Field Toolkit to an on-disk format, uh, and you're only doing that for small molecules, we call that vanilla. And you can go ahead and start trying to put an interchange right now. We're, we're fairly confident that you're gonna get the right numbers or that there's only a few more bugs to shake out. But then we would call proteins non-vanilla because we need to do some more validation about how we're handling hierarchy information like residue names and residue numbers. And in some formats, we need to resolve issues where residue definitions can be tied to the physical parameters. Uh, and that's gonna be complex for us because Smirnoff parameter application rules don't know about residues. So we're gonna to try to get residue handling in as soon as we can uh, so that you can export the systems made by our next generation of force fields. It's a similar situation with virtual sites. Um, we're gonna get these in as soon as possible and we're going to prioritize these higher if it becomes clear that our Rosemary force field will have virtual sites in it. But right now that's a maybe and not a must. So if that becomes certain, the priority of the uh, virtual site exporters will go up. But the big thing that I wanna get across is this message at the bottom. And that is, if you're using ParmEd in a workflow to load components from files. So if you're loading a Parm top or if you're loading a serialized OpenMM system and subsequently combining them, then it's gonna be a while before you can use interchange to replace that. That's gonna require importers. And I would say that those almost certainly will not be supported in 2022. Okay, so that's an update on interchange. I did wanna talk about now getting into force field accuracy topics. We're looking at the possibility of using virtual sites in Rosemary or a subsequent force field release. So we'd worked on an initial implementation of virtual sites in the toolkit a few years ago. But what we found is that the further we got into development, the more complexity we had to add to handle some really tricky edge cases. Um, and these edge cases were technically allowed in the spec, but it pretty much indicated that the user was doing something wrong. But we tried hard to accommodate all of these edge cases and the complexity of this initial implementation ended up being really severe and it made it susceptible to a lot of bugs. So when Simon, our previous science lead, went to work on virtual sites, he kind of took a machete to this complexity. He proposed an update to the Smirnoff specification and he added a new implementation in the toolkit that just ruled that weird edge cases are unsupported. So Simon did a great job with this refactor. It adopts simpler behavior and it doesn't allow ambiguous uses. And even better, this refactor was accompanied by some really stringent tests for parameter assignment and geometry. geometry. And that will help us keep the complexity in check in the future. And so here we're showing a couple different kinds of virtual sites that can be applied. Um, Lily will talk more about the kinds of virtual sites that are likely to go into our initial force field. But this is sort of a proof that we're doing it right now. The geometry looks right. And these are, are correctly interacting um, offsite. Uh, interaction centers. Now, as we're preparing to make a protein force field, there are a few new pieces of infrastructure that we'll need to add to the fitting pipeline. Now, in particular, I'm pretty sure that a lot of our users are here because they want to know if our force fields are going to perform well in predicting binding free energies. So John Codero was gracious enough to make us an introduction to the Folding at Home team. And by a stroke of luck, the Open Free Energy Consortium got started right at the same time. So we started working together on making the infrastructure to regularly run protein ligand binding free energy calculations on Folding at Home. And what I'm showing here is an early working draft of an object diagram involving a mix of existing open force field components and planned open free energy components. And a lot of these are, are have a proof of concept implementation or are fully featured. So what's happening is that we're working with Open Free Energy to define the core object models for their infrastructure. We're preparing and formatting some protein ligand data sets uh, that we can use as standard benchmarks for our force fields. And we're ensuring that our infrastructure will be highly interoperable with the Open Free Energy toolkits and workflows. And so this is very early stage. That's all I'm gonna say about it today. We'll have more to talk about next year or in the coming months. 
but I do want to really encourage you to, to tune in to the Open Free Energy team to hear more about what they have coming. Okay, now the final thing I want to talk about today is adding protein support to the Open Force Field Toolkit. By, quote, supporting proteins, I mean a few things. So for one, I mean efficiently assigning parameters to very large molecules using chemical perception, which is possible, but it's required a bit of refactoring in the toolkit. Another thing that it means is adding data fields and logic for handling hierarchy information like residue names and chains to our core object models. But most of all, it required doing the one thing that we keep telling you not to do. And that is you cannot make an open force field molecule from PDB. And what we've done is we've made this new API point called molecule.fromPolymerPDB that assuming that your input PDB has explicit hydrogens, is only made of canonical amino acids in normal, in you know, reasonable protonation states, and has a correct atom names, we can load that into an open force field toolkit molecule. So you might say, well, wait, why couldn't I load molecules from PDB? Like our DKIT can do it, right? Here's arginine main chain capped. And it looks like things are going well. We've, we've identified a formal charge on the side chain and we've got some double bonds here. Uh, what's wrong? You know, you'd think that everybody wins. But very often with PDB files in the wild, you run into trouble. So here we try to load a capped histidine uh, protonated at the delta nitrogen. And here it wasn't able to recognize any of the bond words. Here's something wrong about this input. And this is a pretty realistic input. I believe this came out of Amber Tools. And so we have to be a little bit strict in how we handle PDB loading because we don't want to have fail deadly cases like this where we automatically try to add some information but we do it wrong and we have no way of warning the user that that happened. So the fundamental issue is that a PDB file doesn't contain all of the connection table information that we need. So instead it's defined that certain atoms with certain names in certain residues should match up with an authoritative template for this residue and that that template will fill in the bond orders and formal charges. Now, that authoritative reference is the RCSB Chemical Components Dictionary. So in conjunction with OpenMN's very strict PDB reader, we've put together functionality in the Open Force Field Toolkit that parses the Chemical Components Dictionary to load the connection table information that we need. So to us, a protein is just a really large Kekulé structure suitable for Smirnoff parameter assignment. And while you might say, you know, wow, that's a lot of work for something that our D kit could kind of do already, what's even more exciting is that building this infrastructure for proteins opens the door for us to load and parameterize user-defined polymers in the future. So I want to take a quick detour and show you what a loaded protein looks like in the Open Force Field Toolkit. Uh, in the first box here. Um, I'm showing our residue iterator. And I have this philosophy that as you move away from the PDB specification and towards anybody holding a force field, the odds that you can find two people that agree on what a residue is, it becomes astronomically unlikely. So we expose this default residue iterator. It's very lightweight. You can customize it if you like. And we expose these default iterators for residues and chains. They're really just there for your convenience. In the open force field toolkit, we still for parameter assignment, we only look at the, the graph. And so these residues don't affect parameter assignment in the open force field toolkit. These residue objects also have a little API where you can query their, their atoms and a few other things. Uh, and we're hoping that this will make it more convenient to deal with proteins in the toolkit. We've also done significant work to build in logic for conversions and round trips so that hierarchy information will survive going to other formats. In the first box, we are sending a open force field molecule and topology over to OpenMM. And we see that OpenMM does recognize that there's one chain, there's some number of residues uh, and you know, the atoms and bonds. And if we go further into that OpenMM topology and we ask about a specific atom, that atom knows about its, its residue information. Uh, and this is sort of a similar thing here. Instead of OpenMM, we've sent that protein to uh, an RD mole. And we can query the atoms of that RD mole, and we see that they know their 
their residue information. So this functionality is really exciting. We're just finishing off the final stages um, before we put this in a production release. So you can try out the pre-alpha now, and we expect to begin a one month RC period in the next week or two, and then to have the final release. Okay, so at this point, you sat through a boring rant about PDBs. Maybe some of you people are weird and you like that. Uh, and then you looked at a bunch of pictures of Jupyter notebooks. And so I'd feel wrong if I let you go home empty handed, thinking that that's all that we had to our PDB functionality. So as part of our alpha testing for the next toolkit release, I asked our scientific communicator, Josh, who's been laboring away thanklessly for months on documentation pros and page margins and color shades to double check that our infrastructure would eventually be able to handle non-standard proteins. And so what I'm going to show you is very pre-production, but if you'd like to learn more, we could run a follow-up workshop on this topic and you can, we'll make sure that you can vote for it in the coming poll. Okay, so here's an alpha helix on the left. Uh, this is five alanines, a cysteine, and then five more alanines. And here's a dye, and this is called fluorescine 5 maleamide. Uh, and it's got this bond in the red circle, and this bond really likes to stick to cysteines. So with a little connection table manipulation, we can combine these to make the product of their coupling shown here on the right. So this central cysteine in the, uh, in the alpha helix <clears throat> has gained a bond to the dye. Well, it would be really neat if we could simulate this. But if I look from the perspective of any single force field, you know, a normal protein force field would look and say, no thanks, you know, I, I can't deal with this messy modified amino acid in the middle. I don't recognize that thing. Uh, and if I look from the perspective of just a small molecule force field, it's going to say, well, yeah, sure, I suppose I could handle that. But, you know, I, I'll put some numbers on these alanines and these backbone torsions, but it's not going to be pretty. And so if only there was some way to let the protein force field handle the stuff that it knows, and then anything that it can't cover to delegate that to the small molecule force field. Well, an interesting thing about this Smirnoff format we keep talking about is that they act directly on Kekulé structures. So they don't care about atom types or residues. Uh, and you can actually, if you read the fine print, you can add two Smirnoff force fields together. And when you do that, you put the parameters that you want to be generic in the first force field and the parameters that you want to be specific that will override the generic parameters. You put those in the second force field. So we could, in theory, load a small molecule force field like SAGE and then append a protein force field. And the molecules that this combined force field parameterizes would get protein parameters for the recognized residues and small molecule parameters for the unrecognized residues. Well, and in, like I mentioned before, it just so happens that we'd worked with Dave Cerruti a while ago to make a Smirnoff format port of Amber's FF14SB, where the parameters were based on Smirks patterns that looked for entire amino acids. So, we can make a single force field by joining SAGE to this port of Amber's FF14SB. And it basically just worked. Uh, on the left, I'm showing all the bonds that were assigned to this modified uh, protein of interest and which force field they came from. So all of the bonds and angles and torsions and van der Waals terms were successfully assigned from either the small molecule or the protein force field. And the protein looking parts, the alanines and the, the backbone, got protein parameters. Those are in yellow for amber. Uh, and the unrecognized parts got sage parameters. And those are in green. And in this case, it's actually kind of interesting to see that the uh, cysteine got protein parameters, even though they're part of a, a larger modified residue, because this substructure happens to look exactly like CYX, the, the disulfide bonded cysteine residues. Um, but then all of the modified, like all of the dye and the modified amino acid got valence parameters from SAGE. Now, the partial charges were a bit trickier because we didn't have a library charge for the modified amino acid. So over here on the right, we had to go and do a separate step where we made a library charge by splicing up the modified residue and then capping and charging it using AM1 BCC, then turning that into a new library charge in this combined force field. And here it is simulating the things that seem like they should be planar, stay planar, um, nothing unfolds. And so things don't look too bad at all. Um, 
we would love to run a force field workshop on hackery like this. And so you can feel free to vote for this in the follow up polls. I'll say at this point, we wouldn't recommend that you actually use this workflow for publishing or anything. Um, Sage and FF14SB have never met. So combining them is maybe a little bit scientifically dubious. Um, not to mention that our FF14SB port is a little bit a little bit unwieldy. But the protein force, but the, the force field combinations that we did here are very similar to how we're going to be making the rosemary force field. We're hoping to use parameter overriding to titrate in a small number of protein specific parameters into a small molecule force field like SAGE to wind up with a force field that captures the most important aspects of protein structure while also remaining well suited for small molecules. So on this high note, I'm gonna turn over the talk to Lily to talk about the details of exactly how we're gonna be making rosemary and what else is on the roadmap for the future. Uh, thank you, Jeff. Um, so hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Lily. I just joined Open Force Field at the start of this month as the science lead. And today, I'd, I'd just like to show some of the amazing work that the science team has done over the past year, uh, what we're currently working on, and some exciting future developments to come. But that is if I can change this slide. Uh, oh, you may need to click in the window to get it. Yeah, no, I am doing that. Uh, um, here, let me cut off your share and try again. Okay, could you request once more? Oh, great. Um, cool. So uh, at the last meeting, uh, Sammy introduced the development that went into the Sage Force field, which was released at the end of August. Uh, as David and Jeff have both introduced, our next big goal is the release of a biopolymer force field, Rosemary. Um, Rosemary will be the first OpenFF force field to incorporate parameters that support proteins and other biopolymers alongside small molecules. Uh, Jeff, I, I still don't seem to be able to change slides. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me restart the share and then we can take one more try. Thanks. Okay, could you request once more? Yeah. Uh, is that me? Yep, that's you. Okay, yeah, fantastic, thank you. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, cool. Yeah, so uh, the next big goal is Rosemary, um, which has been really a massive project. Um, it's been led and driven by Shape and Cavender, but honestly, uh, many people across the entire organization have contributed to the science and the infrastructure uh, and all the other needs of building a protein force field. For example, um, as has been shown by Jeff, a crucial part of this project is an, efficient, is an efficient, intuitive, fully featured interface for working with proteins in the OpenFF toolkit. And to build this, uh, OpenFF scoped out all the necessary features by listening to and working with stakeholders in the community. So the infrastructure team, particularly Jeff and Ivan, spent a significant part of the last year on this really incredible refactor and extension of the toolkit. And the result is the impressive support um, that Jeff just showed. And the additional software features are really just one part of the Rosemary project. With Rosemary, we are focusing on adding several new uh, biopolymer specific parameters, such as the backbone torsions in a protein. To fit these new, these new parameters, we've really been able to uh, capitalize on the existing quantum chemistry pipelines laid out before uh, to systematically generate testing and training data, such as optimized geometries and torsion profiles. And this itself has been kind of a back and forth process where as you generate this QM data, we use it to guide us on selecting which parameters to optimize and where we might need to generate more data uh, to look more into the science. So for example, one question we've had to ask is how specifically should a single torsion parameter apply? With the Smirnoff format, we can choose to model all protein torsions or all protein backbone torsions with say one parameter 
or that have different unique torsions depending on the side chain involved, or possibly even the rhodomeric form of the side chain. Uh, so to look into this, Shapin computed torsion drives of several cat peptides. Um, he looked particularly at one rhodomer of alanine, two rhodomers of proline, and two rhodomers of tryptophan um, to see how, how different the energy profiles were between them. So the side chains were constrained to the particular rhodomeric forms, and the QM energy was calculated at various phi angles on the x-axis and psi angles on the y-axis. Um, he looked at, uh, he also labeled the secondary structure motifs um, on this plot. Um, so with alanine, the torsion drive uh, pretty much looks as we expect uh, with minima at the Gauche conformations. Um, when he looks at the most populated rhodomer of tryptophan, um, it actually does look quite similar to alanine except for this additional minimum here uh, at about psi equals zero, um, which is likely driven by the bulky side chain. Looking at the second rhodomer of tryptophan, however, uh, we see quite a dramatic difference. Um, for example, this minimum at psi equals zero has flipped to about 180 degrees here. And the differences are particularly highlighted if you plot the energy, the, the profiles of the energy differences. So, the difference between the, tryptop the tryptophan rhodomers on top is much more dramatic in scale than between the most populated rhodomers of tryptophan and alanine. Um, ultimately though, while looking at these QM energy profiles is useful, what OpenFF actually cares about uh, is whether we can follow and uh, reproduce the shape of this energy profile with MM parameters, uh, specifically with some number of torsion parameters. So therefore, um, it's uh, probably more useful to compare the different rotomers uh, looking at a few different targets. Uh, the differences in RMSE between the energy profiles of the QM energy, um, of the MM energy as computed by the SAGE force field, and of the MM target. The target that we're looking at here is the difference between the QM and the MM energies, but without the torsion parameters in involved. So the target is basically the energy that we would use to fit a torsion parameter. So interestingly, if we look at just the uh, differences between rotomers of the same side chain um, and also alanine and tryptophan, we see that uh, the RMSE is actually quite low between the MM targets, which implies that um, they actually wind up being fairly similar. Uh, once you look at either rhodomer of proline with any other side chain, however, um, the differences increase dramatically. So given uh, the relatively small differences between rhodomers, but the large differences between proline and every other side chain, um, the initial plan for rosemary was, uh, has been decided to train backbone torsions individually for each side chain um, and to generate some rhodomeric data for validation um, but to treat the, the possibility of fitting independent torsions as a goal for a future release. So this QM data is still being generated. Uh, once that's completed, uh, Rosemary will move on to the fitting stage. Um, here, the currently existing small molecule parameters and the new protein parameters will be fit at the same time so that the entire force field is self-consistent. And that brings us to uh, the final, but very essential part of the Rosemary project, the benchmarking stage. Chapin has been leading a huge effort to curate experimental data, data sets for evaluating protein force fields. Um, based on discussions with domain experts in the theoretical and experimental community, we've decided for now to focus on NMR observables, such as um, chemical shifts and scalar couplings. And as Jeff said earlier, we're also working with open free energy um, to automate protein ligand binding free energies, which are being designed to run on folding at home. So since rosemary will be a single force field that can handle both proteins and small molecule ligands, this will provide um, a means for routine benchmarking against standard protein ligand data sets. So this will give us confidence that our parameters can provide accurate results 
and can also be used for diversity of targets. Uh, besides the fitting of protein parameters, the team at Urban Force Field has been working on many other projects alongside, exploring the many other aspects of force field fitting. The parameters of a force field can be broken down into three groups, um, which have actually aligned with the major focus of each force field release so far. The valence parameters, which were refit in parsley, the van der Waals parameters, which were refit in sage, along with a, another valence refit. Um, and now we're looking at the electrostatics. We're currently working on two major projects that may or may not make it into rosemary, depending on how com confident we are about the quality, uh, but that we think will be hugely valuable going forward. And the first is um, moving away from QM-based methods for electrostatic method, for elect sorry, electrostatics, uh, towards using machine learning models, such as um, graph convolutional networks for predicting partial charges. Um, so graph charges and graph models as a whole are, are very appealing for a couple of reasons. Um, firstly, uh, especially in light of the forthcoming release of Rosemary, um, they are likely to scale much better to larger molecules than QM methods. Um, it would be very useful to be able to apply an efficient unified charge model to both macromolecules and the small molecules. Um, the AM1 BCC method that we currently use becomes quite slow for molecules larger than 150 atoms, and it's really prohibitively expensive for anything on the scale of proteins. Uh, secondly, a known flaw of QM-based methods and AM1 BCC um, is that they give us charges that are conformer dependent. So the same molecule can get different charges, um, you know, if, if different conformers are generated. Uh, and this does affect simulation results and makes them a bit less reproducible. So with a properly trained graph network model, we may be able to support generating partial charges that uh, are the same quality as AM1 BCC, but do not show this conformer dependence um, and could be much faster. So over the past year, um, Simon and the infrastructure team have put together a few software tools, both for training graph models and for applying them with the OpenFF toolkit. And we're now looking at answering scientific questions, such as what would be the best features to incorporate initially and selecting relevant hyperparameters. Um, this project is quite exciting because graph models um, as a whole just show a lot of promise with force fields. Um, the Esper Loma project and package spearheaded by Yuan Xin Wang uh, has been able to learn and predict not just partial charges, but also valence parameters simultaneously. And uh, it's been able to produce self-consistent bipolymer and small molecule force field parameters that perform quite well on test protein ligand systems. And in fact, um, really excitingly, Espeloma has been able to predict M1 BCC partial charges with lower error than the differences between the toolkit backends used by the open force field. Um, so that's really encouraging. Uh, and it might mean that we should soon move to a similar charge model given well, all the other advantages of this approach, uh, such as scalability and giving us conformer independent charges. The second big electrostatics project I'd like to talk about is um, adding offsite charges with virtual sites. So it's quite difficult for um, the classical atom centered fixed charges, fixed charge model to uh, accurately represent parts of um, the electrostatic surface around a molecule. So for example, this methyl bromide has a sigma hole here on the electrostatic surface uh, it, yeah, at HS6 through 1G star, that is. Um, if, however, you project a surface, uh, the surface generated by um, atom-centered M1 BCC charges, um, like these in SAGE, the, uh, the sigma hole is missing. This and, similar result, this and similar issues can result in clear and systematic errors in simulation properties, such as hydration-free energies. So um, knowing that we can add virtual sites to improve the anisotropy uh, and give us an electrostatic surface that corresponds with the QM much more closely, seems like a clear direction um, forward for improving our simulation results. So following this hypothesis, 
The team at Open Forcefield, primarily Simon, Owen, and Trevor, um, have been working towards the goal of adding virtual sites to a force field release. Uh, as discussed by Jeff, the OpenFF toolkit now has robust support for virtual sites, and we're now able to train and test um, a set of virtual site parameters. And a proof of concept study on the enthalpy of mixing of halogens and pyridines was quite promising. Um, in both releases of OpenFF force fields so far, uh, with mixtures containing chlorine, the enthalpy of mixing is systematically overestimated in simulation compared to the experimental value. Adding virtual sites and retraining the charges brought these properties much more in line with experimental values. We saw a similar effect with heteroaromatics. So these data, point, data points um, over here are mixtures of pyridine and perol. In both OpenFF releases, the enthalpies of mixing are calculated at about zero in simulation, even though uh, they have much lower values in experiment. Um, again, adding virtual sites brought them much more in line with experiment, but it did actually worsen the enthalpies of mixing of these data points here. So while this, this proof of promise there, this proof of concept is, is quite promising and exciting, there's still a bit of work to do before virtual sites can make it into a general force field release. Uh, in terms of benchmarks, uh, as David has said, it was quite encouraging to see that adding virtual sites resulted in generally modest improvements overall for our benchmarks, uh, looking at the calculated energy, geometry, and torsion fingerprint metrics over the standard industry benchmark set. And this was, again, sorry, again, particularly uh, surprising for the gas phase energetic, energetics, as we hadn't really expected to see a lot of improvement here. Uh, making this even more encouraging. So um, yeah, we're quite excited about these three projects, uh, virtual sites, graph charge models, and the protein parameters. But a lot more has been going on in parallel. Um, uh, and the dedicated team at Open Force Field has been running many other studies into advancing our force fields. Um, and these, can, these have looked at quite fundamental questions, such as the modifications that we can make to the force field feeding process, and even what level of theory that we should be using to generate the QM data that we used to fit. And um, this was a necessary question to ask because we do wanna ensure that we are using the best method possible to get the best uh, data possible for training our force fields. And there are hundreds of post hartree fock methods, basis set and functionals that could all be used. And they all vary in accuracy, and chemi over chemical regions and computational cost. Um, Kiesu and Pavan curated a set of molecules covering a diverse range of chemistry and calculated torsion profiles using a number of different methods shown here. And after doing all that work, surprisingly, they found that the current default method that we're already using um, actually worked quite well. That's B3LIP D3BJ with a double zeta basis set um, where the RMSC in, uh, in torsion profiles was only about 0.1 kilocalories per mole uh, worse than the best functional that they tested. And quite importantly, it was also the fastest functional that they tested. So given this uh, optimal balance between quality and speed, we decided to keep using this method for generating QM data. Um, so looking back at the overall feeding pipeline, we've also been looking at updates to the feeding process itself. This included both the initial values that we used to fit and updates to how we construct the target and, optim and objective function for optimization. Uh, the first project looking at initial values solves a couple of different problems. When Parsley was released, we, re we realized that our fitting procedure um, had been resulting in unphysically low sulfonamide valence angles, especially in simulation. And that actually these angles have been getting lower with each force field release. Uh, this problem was fixed in SAGE by excluding vibrational frequency targets when fitting parameters. So a different update to the force field fitting process. But another systematic solution uh, is to use the modified seminaria method to derive initial bond and, ang and angle values from the QM Hesha matrix instead. This gives us 
much more physically intuitive uh, bonset angles and actually also results in some improvement on the geometry targets um, on our standard benchmark set. Uh, this was actually part of a systematic exploration of potential updates to the fitting process. Uh, another thing we looked at, as David mentioned earlier, was also um, explicitly including dihedral deviations when we fit to optimize geometry targets. Combining this change with the modified seminario method to the fitting process showed greater improvements in the geometry and torsion fingerprint um, benchmarks than either change alone. So these are really great examples of advances that we can make to force fields without needing new parameters or input data, but just by tweaking the, the fitting process itself and, and measuring performance on standard benchmarks. And we have you know, quite a few other studies for improving force field fittings in the, footing in the works. One really cool direction is applying surrogate modeling to our optimization process. Here, uh, instead of using uh, simulation data to uh, optimize as we currently are, uh, the simulations are first used instead to construct a surrogate model. The surrogate model is optimized instead, and, and the solution is checked kind of iteratively using simulations uh, before a solution is accepted. Um, this, address, this addresses two problems with our current optimization process. Firstly, that it's quite likely that the solutions we currently get from our simulation-based models are in relatively close local minima. And secondly, that uh, training to simulation-based physical properties is just quite expensive computationally. So Owen has carried out a really exciting proof of concept study where he used surrogate modeling to refit van der Waals parameters uh, from the first possibly force field. This surrogate fit resulted in a much lower objective function um, as shown in this, uh, the black crosses here, and also gave sigma and epsilon values that were dramatically changed from the initial parsley force field. So this is pretty cool. Um, it suggests that optimization did manage to at least explore different minima. Uh, so we're quite excited to explore surrogate modeling further and see how it can improve uh, how we fit our force fields. Another direction that could really change, change up our process is Trevor's work on using automated chemical perception to determine parameters to fit in the force field. Um, so basically this is starting, um, this is the idea that you can start from one very general parameter, such as one for every single bond or angle of torsion in the force field and split it out um, automatically to apply to different chemistries as needed. Uh, this would be much more systematic and efficient than the manual process that we currently follow. Um, it would hopefully reduce the likelihood of grouping dissimilar parameters together with overly broad parameters or supporting redundant values. And yeah, in fact, uh, Trevor's been doing a lot of work on an alkane data set. And when comparing it to SAGE, he's uh, shown that we can achieve close force field fits with much fewer bonds and angle parameters than the SAGE force field currently has. So there's a lot of room for automated par parameter perception to really advance our force fields. And yeah, there are more projects, many more that Open Force Field is working on that um, we can really show here. Um, just to name a few, and I will note that the dotted lines here don't quite correspond with Jeff's key. Um, these projects are definitely well, like uh, uh, have already been started and have already had a lot of work and effort invested into them. Um, they, so one, some of the uh, works here look at um, tweaking the parameters themselves, uh, like explicitly enumerating uh, torsion multiplicities, um, work done by Jessica Mott and Pavan Bahara, um, or using Weiberg bond, Weiberg bond orders to interpolate improper torsions. And we're also looking at using internal coordinate hessians um, as fitting targets in uh, optimization work that was originally started by uh, Hye Su Jang. So yeah, we believe that everything on this page 
and all of these directions that we're exploring will be really valuable in advancing our force fields and our process. And hopefully we'll show up in a force field release in the coming future. And we're always looking around for more ideas. So please do stay for the discussion at the end of the keynote if you have ideas on where we should go after Rosemary. But different projects will re require more or less effort for varying levels of payoff. So we do have to choose which to prioritize with the resources that we have available. And this kind of planning is an organization level decision um, and something that we really depend on uh, Diego for. So with that, I'll hand over to Diego for a broader pers perspective on the long-term goals of Open Force Field and the strategy that we need to get there. Thank you so much, Lily. Um, yeah, hi everyone. Uh, I'm Diego Nolasco. Uh, I'm the scientific project manager at OMSF. And for now, I'm being shared between OpenFF and OpenFE. And um, it's been really cool. It's been a really cool journey for me since January. Uh, so um, today I'm not talking about uh, uh, project management. Uh, I'm, I'm talking about a little bit about strategy. And um, the, the OpenFF initiative is a side tech organization. And uh, in this way, our endeavor involves both science and technology. We can divide our efforts into two equally important fronts, making our models um, more accurate and uh, slash useful, uh, um, and providing additional features uh, slash functionalities for our users. The balance between these two possibilities is defined only by the amount of resources available to us. If we choose to be a low cost institution, uh, um, we will be forced to commit ourselves. Sorry uh, to interrupt much. Diego. Yeah. You need, to, you need to click to take over the screen. Oh. Uh, I'm clicking, yeah, could, could you please go back to slides? Yes, this one, thank you so much. Uh, I'm going to try to press one. Yeah, it's working. Could, could you please go back? Not, nice, thank you. Um, so uh, I was saying that, um, yeah, if we choose to be a low cost institution, uh, we will be forced to commit ourselves much more to maintaining and gradually developing a few fun, foundational core products than to the possibility of innovating on a daily basis. If we assume a somewhat more expensive positioning, we can lean much more towards uh, the, the new features without, of course, neglecting the, the maintenance of the, the quality of what has already been released. Um, in, that, in, in view of that, a well-defined strategy is crucial. Uh, dealing with the unknown is a must. Uh, some do this by relying on luck, hoping that tomorrow will magically bring the dreamed results. Uh, others simply engage. Uh, taking responsibility for building each step that will lead them to their most audacious goals uh, rather than waiting for the future to arrive. Um, so uh, let me show you how I believe uh, we should align organizational strategy with our concrete plans. So what are our organizational value disciplines? Organizations that have taken leadership positions in their industries over, over the past decade have generally done so by narrowing, not broadening their focus. Uh, they focused on delivering superior customer value according to one of three value disciplines, product leadership, user proximity, or operational excellence. And uh, meeting minimal industry standards in the others. 
Uh, at OpenFF, we are not that different. In discussions with the OpenFF team leads, we ranked 21 organizational priorities related to the aforementioned value disciplines. The results indicated that our initiative should focus on product leadership with user intimacy uh, as a secondary goal and operational excellence in the last place. For us, product leadership refers to the accuracy of and, and, and usability of our force fields and core tools, whereas proximity with users uh, refers to hands-on support in building custom solutions. Given our unique position as an open source initiative, the resources we put into product leadership will compound and we will get a disproportionate return on investment compared to custom solutions for individual users. For example, as we improve the quality of our force fields, more external packages will contribute resources toward interoperability, which will benefit everyone. What product leadership really means is that we want to produce the best force field and software in this space and be recognized as doing so. This means we need to work closely um, uh, with, with, with you guys, uh, our, our core users, to ensure we met your needs. Uh, but, but also that our operations need to be excellent. Uh, that's, of course, not enough, though. Um, the force fields and tools themselves need to be outstanding. The goal to excel in the force field area must play a key role in how we prioritize our software and infrastructure. Product leadership depends on usability, uh, depends on, on the usability of our models and the accuracy of their predictions. We could be covering more chemistry. We could be building more accurate parameters, uh, new functional forms, and uh, we could be exporting them to more uh, uh, formats. I'm sure this is a matter of time and resources, of course. Uh, to promote proximity with users, we need to expand the scope of our communication channels. This goes beyond holding meetings with our boards. We need to build channels that allow personalized and specialized service, especially when it comes to requesting new features. Uh, finally, it is extremely necessary to give differentiated attention to the pursuit of operational excellence. If we manage to optimize our processes accordingly, defining specific teams for specific tasks, such as development and maintenance, we will end up promoting more than specialization. We will be promoting reactivity, speed. Uh, finally, it is quite evident that all these possibilities lack resources, both human and uh, financial. So why should we have a strategy? Our strategy must be the source of reasoning for our decision-making. It is the strategy that should guide the process of building our project portfolio and this should be based on how we will add value to our users. Projects, in turn, need to allow the delivery of results that, when, anal when analyzed collectively, reflect our mission. Our daily work must be focused on achieving this mission. Of course, we need uh, constant monitoring so we recognize when we go off track and can readjust. Our strategy must serve as the key basis for everything we do, but also must be something that adapts to reality as the, projects, uh, as, as the project uh, goes on. Um, what is Strat, uh, what, what, what is a project for? 
The Open Forest Field Initiative is a project-driven organization. This means that we must always be planning, executing, and, or, or studying projects. Because of that, the most important definitions of my current uh, professional life are projects are ways of delivering the organization's strategy. And uh, a project is a temporary endeavor that aims for a single outcome and has limited resources. I repeat these phrases every day. I need to internalize these two definitions like I internalize my daughter's name. I do this to empower myself when I need to decide in favor of the projects I manage and consequently in favor of our organizational strategy. Projects serve to translate the strategy into reality. Projects are where we actually take action and make decisions. When we do this in an organized and appropriate way, we always have the chance to reduce the risks inherent to the process and speed up the launch of our products to our user community. As we need to understand that time and cost are extremely closely related. Uh, continuous improvement must also be considered in our project ideas, as it is uh, uh, through this that we will pave the way towards excellence. Uh, uh, thus, we need to learn all the time in every, in every opportunity, because this is the mindset that will drive us to improve every day and that will ensure that we will continue on the right path. To continue to succeed into the future, we must continue to innovate in a sustainable way. So uh, how does strategy affect our daily lives? The Open Force Field Initiative, or something similar to it, has been dreamed of by different players who are interested in building a solid bridge between academia and industry. Even here in Brazil, professors like me have always conjectured about the possibility of designing some kind of organization that would work as a link between research groups with the potential to do science and develop technologies uh, and companies with the budget to offer support. So please know we work in a pioneering organization. If you are part of the OpenFF team, feel privileged as your role is to contribute to the solidification of an extremely audacious undertaking. Hopefully, many of our pharma, pharma partners uh, feel, the same, feel the same way about the effort as a whole. We're excited about the way this project allows us to share and interchange ideas and data and work together as what sometimes feels like a global team with no single organizational home. I would like to understand, uh, I would like you to understand how we as an organization that brings together professionals with different skills are ahead of our time. If you like me have been in the workforce for over 20 years, I'm sure you agree uh, with me when I say that uh, open force, the Open Force Field Initiative is a genuinely avant-garde initiative. Instead of hierarchical structures, we implement interdisciplinary structures. This implies understanding that we act as if we were our own bosses. As we contribute each, or, uh, each in our own way, unique and complementary skills. Uh, instead of bureaucratic bonds, we implement value-based relationships where we seek to provide value to one another. Instead of activity management, we implement self-managing teams as, we, uh, as, as each of us is self-motivated and highly inspired in doing what we do. Instead of centralized information, we implement distributed information since transparency is one of our pillars. Instead of sector results, we value collective results 
as we understand that we are free to do what we do because we trust our co-workers will take care of the other tasks that need to be performed. Finally, instead of a physical environment, we seek excellence in the virtual environment, which allows us to achieve considerable financial savings. In short, we are able to reach extraordinary levels of achievement because we have the freedom to make the most of our abilities, which means that we feel free to put our knowledge and our abilities at the service of this organization with the attitude of someone who knows they have the freedom to do so. All of this is the result of a judgment-free environment. And uh, how can you help build, uh, foster, and sustain our strategy? Well, this is, this is an easy one. Just understand that whatever your role is, you can get involved or inspire others to get involved with the initiative. We need more scientists, more developers, and more industrial partners so we can actually make the future we dream about a reality. I honestly hope you understand that what I am doing now is an invitation, a request I would even say, for you to engage in broadcasting the purpose of the Open Force Field Initiative, transla translating cutting edge science around molecular modeling and simulation into technology. This is, uh, the, the, there is so much great science and engineering to do, and we need and want your continuing help doing it. It has been, and I hope it continues to be, a pleasure to build rational solutions to the problems of humanity at your side. Thank you very much. David, uh, back to you, I think. Yeah, thank you. So um, we're at the end of our time and or coming up on the end of our time and um so i just want to wrap up by recapping a little bit um we've told you about a bunch of the exciting science that's going on or at least giving you a flavor of some of it ranging from where we're heading with the um, protein force field and to different aspects of science that are being explored virtual sites graph charge models um modified seminario method for better starting parameters and a lot in this space. And we hope you, you're you excited about where things are headed. We certainly are, and there's so much left to be done. And we're convinced that we're gonna be able to continue improving force field accuracy um, as we work through this. And on the infrastructure side, there's a lot going on as well. The spoke fit is out now, um, lots of, different improvements coming, including for biopolymers and support for the other science that's going on, uh, folding at home benchmarking interfaces and interchange. So uh, we hope you're excited about all of this. We certainly are. And um, we have appreciate you taking the time to join us today. It's, um, it's an exciting time and we hope that uh, you uh, continue to interact with us and, and take advantage of, of what we're building. With that, we're going to wrap up and move to um, discussion. I think one, please raise your hands if you have anything you'd like to chime in. Here are some ideas for things we could we could talk about, but also if you have questions on things that we've covered, we, we're happy to take questions. Um, one thing that's come up, um, if you're interested in support for uh, non-protein polymer force fields. So maybe um, polymer developments for non-biopolymers. Um, there's a funding opportunity um, that's been brought to us in that area. So if, if you're working in industry and have interest in that area, please reach out as we could potentially uh, connect you up with something. But anyway, um, please weigh in on these. Um, we're interested also in input on um, several other areas. So how should we combine parameterized components? Um, where should we plan to go after graph charges and virtual sites? And bigger picture, what, what would you like to see open force field look like in three years? 
Um, Alberto asked about non-protein polymer support, including lipids. Yeah, that, that could be one. Um, the, I've shared a possible funding opportunity in the consortium advisory board channel. So um, that could be a place to look, but um, so biopolymers, lipids and nucleic acids might be more in the biopolymers area, but they could fall within the scope of that. Anybody have hands up? I don't see any hands up yet. Oh, we got Chris Bailey. Uh, go ahead, Chris. I should have uh, unmuted your mic. Okay. Um, so, uh, and firstly, if I have tons of questions, but I'm sure other people have them too. I'll just begin with one, and that is um, with the biopolymer force field, um, one of the things that makes it difficult to apply a Smirnoff force field is that the Smirnoff uh, approach depends upon using substru substructure search to identify where to apply parameter. But with a biopolymer, once you know it's a histidine, you actually almost don't need that, that kind of format anymore in that you know from the graph, all the torsions, they're all in a library. So this whole aspect of for biopolymers with residues, you've got, li it seems to be library structured. Could one make the whole, could one adapt the open force field? So with biopolymer, perhaps we don't need to use this sub substructure based matching, but instead take advantage of library parameters and library charges. Yeah, I jump into that and I would say, uh, two fronts. Um, number one, I mean, that's that's how T-Leap work. That's that's how a lot of existing tools work. And so, um, you know, there there wouldn't be really an advantage to reinventing that, um, given that the infrastructure already exists. The second is uh, if I don't know if you've looked at our FF14 SB port, but we we do do this library approach, and what we wind up with is kind of a large unwieldy force field. Um, because we have to cover different protonation states and consider uh, cases where things are C-terminal or N-terminal or both, uh, we end up with this explosion of very large parameters and it makes the force field sort of hard to manipulate and hard to reason about where, you know, we look at our small molecule force field and we can point at one particular torsion and say, hey, maybe we should split this up in different chemical contexts. Uh, with a library-based force field, these parameters are gonna be so large at and you know so so specific in their in their initial construction that they will be really hard to um, to improve in a gradual way. Thanks. I have another one. Please. Huh. Well. While we're, if uh, I'd be happily cede the floor to other people who want to ask questions, um, in Lily's presentation on the um, virtual sites, it really struck me how, um, when we looked at the overall um, objective metrics and and how well they improved, um, they you know the improvements were modest, but that was kind of looking at the global parameters. And what I'm wondering is whether the the global metric improvement is is how you assess the overall force field but with the virtual the virtual site so this is looking at the objective function in terms of the overall improvements to the um energies and torsions it's kind of one of the other yeah so a couple slides after this thanks Jeff. there and and so i'm wondering whether well you know those those are the metrics which drive the overall force field I'm wondering whether it's worth saying, well, where we would look for improvements with the virtual sites is in the chemistries that are actually using the virtual sites. And that's something that I wouldn't mind seeing is, you know, in the in the uh, DDEs and in the RMSDs and the torsion fingerprints, how much of an improvement was actually attained in the chemistries which were really using and exercising those um, virtual sites. Uh, 
Um, thanks, Chris. That, that's a really good point. And um, honestly, Simon would be a better person to talk about this. Uh, but my, my perspective is because the charges were refit to account for the virtual sites, we do also want to check that at least they don't result in um, unimprovements on the benchmarks and detract from results to standard chemistries that um, we don't want to be affected by the virtual sites. Yes, I, I completely agree with you. And I guess that's where I'm saying what, what I'm these this slide that I'm looking at is a slide that shows me that we haven't ruined anything. We, you know, we made everything became a, a hair better. But I think what would really be convincing to me as a as somebody who's done a lot of, you know, small molecule modeling in industry is knowing that in the chemical um, moieties that that we're really suffering from not having the virtual sites. If I've got a major improvement in there, then that kind of is the justification for all the overhead and weight of putting in those virtual sites, even if over the thousands and thousands of molecules that don't have any virtual site, it at least hasn't broken anything. And I guess where I'm going with this also is as uh, I was hearing in the presentation today as we're going to um, custom fitting or or focusing focused fitting on certain areas of the force field or certain chemistries, it might be really you know ultimately we've got to show we haven't ruined the large force field, but what might be really helpful to see is how much we've improved the area that we focused on. Yeah, I think that would be a good idea. And we actually had a question from um, a member of the governing board the other day about where exactly we're planning on putting virtual sites. Um, and so, yeah, when we when we talk about, oh, well, what if we only look at the subset of molecules where we do get virtual sites or chemistries where we do get them? Um, and I can't recall, Lily, if you mentioned it, but we're we're aiming to be a little bit conservative with the initial release. I think we're looking at what, sigma holes and aromatic nitrogens, and then things like lone pairs on sulfurs or oxygens may come later. So not a direct answer to your question, but maybe a little more context about um, how exactly they'll be used. Yeah, the other note on that is, you know, that's at some level a whole science project or a series of science projects um, that can and should be done is, where exactly do virtual sites provide the most gains? This is a good area of interface with Danny Cole's group and their work on bespoke force fields for individual molecules, because they have quite a bit of insight from that on where virtual sites seem to be helping. So in some cases we can, we can draw on their molecule specific findings and, and try to generalize a bit. But um, yeah, the infrastructure supports putting them in pretty arbitrary places. So this is a good, a good place for people to get involved with, you know, spin-off science projects to see where they're going to provide the most gains. I'm going to go back to our discussion slide. There's a lot of great discussion happening in chat. Um, oh, and I see I'm misaddressing my messages. Uh, but yeah, does anybody else uh, want to ask a new question? Feel free to raise your hand um, for a new question on voice chat, or we can we can continue in the text chat as well. Yeah, I do see some. It, it sounds like twice today now we're, we're thinking about ways that we could take advantage of residue information um, to make something like a, a library parameter that, that matches a whole residue and it recognizes that whole residue either by substructure or by um, sort of PDB residue name uh, information, atom name information. And so again, I, I do want to reemphasize that it's, it's a big part of our philosophy that we don't want to be looking at uh, cosmetic things like residue names uh, during parameter assignment. It's important that we look only at the chemistry. And it's by doing this that we'll, we'll be able to wind up using a consistent set of tooling to, to gracefully handle modified proteins and stuff like that, where the, the force fields meld nicely um, between sort of unnatural components and natural components. If we start treating 
uh, the protein as, as you know, whole substructures or something like that. I think we do get ourselves in a little bit of risk that uh, this, you know, the arbitrary small molecule part of the force field and the protein part of the force field won't end up being compatible. Any other input on these discussion points or anything else? Oh, um, this is also a good time to mention, do we have a slide on this? The follow-up workshop topics. Oh, we'll be sending out a survey shortly. Um, we've we've assembled and we'll, we'll do that in the general channel and we'll also send a follow-up email um, to the invitation to this meeting. And so you'll have one week to vote on uh, follow-up topics that you'd like to be the subject of an interactive workshop. Um, yeah, so we, we did this before and it worked well. So we went really fast through a lot of things today. And if you're interested in hearing more about some of them, you're going to get a chance to vote on what you'd like to hear more about. And we'll have a follow-up workshop on that. Um, Alberto, you have your hand up? Yeah, and Alberto, we've enabled your microphone, but you need to turn it on from your end. Yeah, can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Okay, uh, for the virtual sites, couldn't we look at our QM data and find uh, examples where the electrostatic potentials differ from QM to what we currently have and use that to identify uh, places where we could help with virtual sites? That's a great question. And I'll let Lily take the first swing at that, but if she declines, I can I can jump in. Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, that would be an interesting approach. Uh, well, we've been targeting low hanging fruit so far, but that would be, I think a great way to move in the future. Jeff, did you have anything else to say? Yeah, so one interesting thing is that um, like I talked about, our, our QC stack is a little bit particular and it has to deal with some, some interesting constraints. And so generally when we run our QC jobs, we're not saving um, the, the wave functions or the output electrostatics grids. But shortly before he left, I think Simon did recognize the importance of having a large diverse set of um, completed QM jobs where we have this information where we can reconstruct the electrostatics grid and or the electron density grid and uh so before he left he put together a very large data set of of molecules that could be good candidates for virtual sites or other sort of charge fitting um and that's something that we can draw upon now that it's now that it's done it took a while to run on qc archive but uh now that it's available we can draw on that to do exactly the kind of things that you said great Oh, and Pavan has posted the um, identify the uh, data set for that in the chat if you want to go check it out. I'll do. Cool. Well, thank you so much, everyone. We've we've reached the end of our time, but uh, you're probably all on Slack, uh, and you can feel free to contact us in other ways. Again, be watching your email and the general channel on Slack for the link to the follow up uh, workshop poll and. We know that all of Europe is about to go on vacation for two months, so we'll probably be scheduling uh, these follow-up workshops to happen in late August or a little bit later. And that will also give our presenters time to assemble software that you can actually install and distribute notebooks. Thanks, everybody. All right, see you later. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.